If the scripture says, touch no unclean thing, how can you not touch it if you don't know what's unclean and what's not unclean? If the scripture says, do not be unequally yoked with unbelievers, how can you know if you haven't made a judgment over who's the believer and who's the not believer? If the scripture says, have nothing to do with the fruitless deeds of darkness, but rather expose them, how can you do that unless you make a judgment about what's dark and what's light? If the scripture says there are those who practice a form of godliness but deny its power, have nothing to do with them, how can you not have anything to do with them unless you make a judgment about those who have a form without power? If the scripture says do not be partners with the disobedient, how can you obey that scripture if you don't make a judgment over who's obedient and who's disobedient? Do you see how twisted the, the, the so-called Christian teaching today is that it's all supposed to be just all ooga booga, lovey lovey, kissy kissy, huggy huggy. It's all an absolute lie. Hello, my dear brothers and sisters in Christ, Brother Michael here. In this recording, I'm going to be sharing with you my personal reply to a sister who reached out to me recently after the Taylor Matthew 24 11 fiasco and the truth was revealed in my video called Deconstructing Satan's Schemes. She asked me to forgive her and admitted that she had been led astray into these things that were being said and she began to believe these lies as the truth. Let me just pause and say that that is always the strategy of Satan is to disconnect you from hearing the truth and get you to believe a lie as the truth. I watched this very thing happen with my children. My children knew who I was. They loved me. I didn't believe they could ever forget that truth, but all of us can forget the truth when a lie is repeatedly hammered over and over and over into our hearts and our minds, and the truth is not there to soldier on and push that lie back and out of its place. Now, in this instance, God had me close my mouth for a long time. I never answered a single one of the uh, accusations made in those 1,650 comments on her video, other than to make a 20-minute segment where I asked Taylor to repent and humble herself and told Matthew 24, 11 he wasn't even a Christian long before I found out the character of who he was and his identity as JP and JC. I knew by recognizing a tree by its fruit that no true spirit-filled Christian could do what he was doing. Now, because I separated from that and went silent and pulled off a of YouTube, there becomes a vacuum of truth and the only thing left is the lie. In this instance, I'm 100% confident God did this for a reason. It's a testing of those who will go on with him and can see and know and remember the truth and those who will not. And it's an opportunity to separate, if you will, in the natural, the goats from the sheep, spiritually speaking. Literally, there has been a separation putting people into camps by this. So when God pulled back the truth, it allowed the lie. And you see, God says those who do not love the truth, 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, will be given such a powerful delusion by God that they will effectively believe the lie as the truth. And therefore, they will be condemned because they have not loved the truth, but have delighted in the wickedness. As I pulled away from this, you can see there's a vacuum of truth and people begin to believe these lies that are pounded repeatedly, repeatedly, repeatedly as the truth. So this sister came out of that, but she came out still with some questions that I felt were legitimate, especially because I recognized she was sincere and I knew other people would have these questions. But it's really important for me to remind you and her that all of her questions that she asks that I'm answering, they're all rooted in Matthew 24, 11's channel. These were all questions that he posed or accusations he made regarding being on YouTube, off YouTube, comments, no comments, prophecy dates, etc., on his website. And remembering a tree produces after its own kind and the root determines the fruit. We have to remember the source in order to, you know, really think about what is the validity of questions like this. However, I believe there is a principle here about the need in all these types of questions, no matter what they are, to look beneath the surface. And that's what I'm attempting to do for this sister in this message and for you today is to remind all of us as spiritual Christians, there's a real need to look beneath the surface, as Jesus said, so that we may make right judgments. 
If you look in the description again, you'll see her entire email if you'd like to see what she wrote and what she was struggling with. I've put that in there exactly the way she wrote it, excluding her name in order to keep her anonymous like she requested. May the Lord Jesus Christ bless all of us as we listen. Good morning. This is Brother Michael. God bless you in Jesus' name. I thought I would take a few minutes this morning and try to answer your concerns and your questions after you answered my last um, email about whether or not you believed Matthew 24, 11 was actually born again and being animated by the Spirit of Jesus Christ or not. And I do appreciate the fact that you can see Matthew seven eighteen. And because I believe that you can see the truth and because I believe that you are sincere I looked at your questions and honestly, in my natural self, I could say, oh, come on, haven't we got bigger questions to ask? Haven't there been so many other great evidences that God is with me that I would have to answer these seemingly petty things? I have that part of me because I have had to answer so many questions for so many years because of God's dealings in my life. But I haven't run out of total patience yet, praise the Lord. And when I see somebody like you, who sincerely, as you say, it's causing you some double-mindedness, I wanna do whatever I can to try to help you. I see that Paul, when they began to struggle and fall away from the faith because he was put in prisons repeatedly, and he was shipwrecked, and he was snake bitten, and he was whipped, and he was in danger from brothers, and he was in danger from Gentiles, and he was in this situation homeless, and he was in this situation naked, and he's in this situation out at sea for a night and day, and he's having all these sufferings. It causes the believers to doubt. And so you can see he tries to encourage them and says, please, you know, do not be discouraged on account of me. You know, my chains are for your good. And he had to really try to encourage. And I bet there was probably more encouragement behind the scenes than even in the letters that we have of him. It's a bit like Jesus trying to run back and encourage John the Baptist. Listen, tell him that I am the one because now John the Baptist is having all these doubts. That's double-mindedness, isn't it? Where... He's wondering, is Jesus the one or should we expect someone else? Because he's been telling everybody of this great Messiah of which the old covenant seems to portray as a military political type Messiah and how Jesus shows up riding a, a donkey and now um, he was supposed to set the captives and the prisoners free and yet John the Baptist is in prison. This doesn't make any sense, does it? It's a very difficult thing. So remembering first and foremost, there's a couple of big things that I want to share with you. Three main points that come to me right now. Number one, God's ways are so much higher than ours that are higher than the heavens are above the earth and that we don't really even come close to understanding that. Number two, every single problem that I've had that you're struggling with is rooted not in my sin, but in the sin of two women, Carrie and Persis. And number three, you forget that even though I have had a very prophetic call on my life and still do, as you will see even more so of in the Relentless Heart new website, I am not an angel. I am not Jesus. I am not without human imperfection and sin and the ability to make mistakes. I'm not without the ability to get angry in a way that's unrighteous. I'm not without the ability to make judgments that are not right. I'm not without the ability to um, act hastily in a moment where the pain of suffering persecution in long periods of time, I'm not without that. And I think if we look at those three things, you can find that a lot of these questions that you're concerned about, issues of leaving comments or no comments, leaving YouTube or not leaving YouTube, these are very petty issues. They may not seem to you, but I would want you to see that these are little bitty stumbling blocks Jesus always struggled with the teachers of the law and the Jews and the Pharisees 
because all of the things that he was doing were constantly being tripped over, whether it was him accepting money from women, whether it was him being homeless, whether it was him allowing his disciples to pick grains on the Sabbath, whether it was him healing on the Sabbath, or maybe it was him violating the law of Moses when the woman is caught in adultery and um, he lets her go. If you look at something that the Lord has been bringing to my teachings a lot lately, in particularly the uh, most recent videos, and then in the website, John 7, 24, I read it uh, to you from the NLT. Look beneath the surface so you can judge correctly. It's a principle that happens all throughout his teachings. He'll say, you know, you make human judgments. And he's actually rebuking people when they do that. So you have that part of you, as do I, that can look at something with human understanding and reasoning and something won't add up. And if you're not looking beneath the surface, you can trip over that thing that doesn't add up. So with me, give the example of the comments and the YouTube or the defending myself and not defending myself, which I'll address as best I can for you here shortly. But if you don't look beneath the surface of these issues, you'll end up tripping like so many do. And if you look, every time Jesus was doing something on the Sabbath, the people were not looking beneath the surface. They weren't seeing spiritually the Sabbath was made for man, not man for the Sabbath. They weren't seeing that Jesus had come actually to abolish the law and all of its commandments by fulfilling it. They weren't yet understanding that. They weren't understanding that Jesus was the Lord of the Sabbath. They weren't understanding that the heart of the law and the heart of God is mercy. They weren't understanding that it is always more important to do good than it is to simply adhere to an external regulation of the law. They were failing repeatedly to look beneath the surface to see the bigger meaning, the bigger purpose in this. I think at a foundational level, I'd like to present to you something that will be on the New Relentless Heart website in great detail right out of the scriptures that I think will help you to understand and view some of the things that you're concerned about differently. May it be in the name of Jesus Christ, bless it, Lord. So knowing that God's ways are higher than ours, higher than the heavens are above the earth, higher than, right? So that means we have our atmosphere and then there's the heavenlies that you can see with your eyes, the stars. God is telling us that his ways and thoughts are beyond what we can even perceive to be the distance between our atmosphere and the heavens above. That's a long, long way off. So when you try as a finite human being to interpret and understand an infinite creator, there is always going to be a gap that leaves all of us spinning, that will leave all of us with a sense of double-mindedness. Don't you see how there's a double-mindedness going on with the teachers of the law and the Pharisees regarding Jesus all the time. Well, no one could speak like this if he wasn't from God. Think about how you would say that about me. Think about how you would say the same thing. You've admitted that the teachings have been a real blessing to you. Well, how can that be if I'm not from God? Right? The people were always divided. He's a good man. No, he deceives the people. He's a prophet. No, he's devil-possessed. He's the son of God. No, he casts out devils by the power of Beelzebub. He's a charlatan. He's a heretic. There was double-mindedness. And it's if you see properly, it's because they were not able to look beneath the surface to see deeper about what God was doing. And they tripped over all these seeming contradictions. Now, hold on a second. You say that you're here to fulfill the law. And you said us in Matthew 5 and 6 and 7 that... You haven't come to abolish the law, and yet here you are telling us to let this woman go who was caught in adultery? Oh, don't get me started, sister. 
I literally have studied the teachings of Jesus so much that I can make Jesus contradict himself by just, there, there was just one example right there. He said, do not suppose I have come to abolish the law and the prophets. And yet, here he, here he, he, he abolishes the law when the lady caught in adultery is forgiven rather than stoned. The Pharisees were right. Jesus was wrong. The law said she was to be stoned. But we know Jesus isn't wrong. We know Jesus is bringing something that they were not yet able to see beneath the surface. He was doing something different. Sticking with this principle, looking beneath the surface. If you can do that now with my story, and I've had to do this. The Lord has had to help me, and you'll see this on the website. Don't you see that there's double-mindedness and contradictions all throughout the scripture? Don't you see, I mean, and I've, I've named them. There are countless things. There are, there are contradictions in the scripture that are too innumerable. If you allow yourselves to be circumcised, Galatians, Jesus Christ is of no longer use to you fallen away from grace. Timothy, come here, I'm going to circumcise you. Sister, I have a whole document in my, my, um, my Bible of contradictions. There are too many to go through now. Things that, are, that absolutely make no sense. God allowing Cain to kill Abel, but then not allowing anybody to kill Cain? What? I mean, it starts right there in the beginning, and it just, God saying it's not good for Adam to be alone, so he makes him a wife that then leads him to his death? What? If it wasn't good for him to be alone, how much is it not good for him to have a wife who leads him to death and interrupts the pattern and design that you had to be in relationship with Adam, Lord? Oh, wow. If I could just pause here and had the time, I would take you through all the contradictions in Scripture Something went this way, and now it went this way. And this happens for those who have eyes to see over and over and over again. And they are double-mindedness. They are contradictions. They are perplexities that are horrendous. How do you tell a Jeremiah? In fact, I'm just going to open up and read it to you. I mean, think about how you've stumbled over a few things right, in my, his dealings in me. Look at this example where Jeremiah says, look, I'm only a child. I, I, I can't do this. And God says, don't be afraid. I'm with you. I'm going to rescue you. I'm going to put my words in your mouth. I'm going to point you over nations and kingdoms to uproot, tear down, to destroy, to overthrow, to build, and to plant. This sounds powerful. God is going to be with this man in a powerful way. Then he says, get yourself ready. Stand up and say to them, whatever I command you, don't be terrified or I will terrify you before them. Now listen to what God says in verse 18 of chapter one of Jeremiah. Today, I have made you a fortified city, an iron pillar and a bronze wall to stand against the whole land, against the kings of Judah, its officials, its priests and the people of the land. They will fight against you, but they will not overcome you, for I am with you and will rescue you, declares the Lord. Okay? So this you read and you say, wow, this is powerful. This is absolutely incredible. God is getting ready to show with power that he is going to be with this prophet. Okay? What you then see in the rest of Jeremiah's ministry absolutely contradicts everything that he has just been told by God. And Jeremiah is absolutely perplexed. And he has had his world turned upside down. He has to turn around and say, will you be deceptive waters to me? Will you lie? He starts to complain to God 15 chapters in. When your words came, I ate them. 
They were my joy and my heart's delight, for I bear your name. I never sat in the company of revelers. I never made merry with them. I sat alone because your hand was on me and you had filled me with indignation. Now listen to this. Why is my pain unending and my wound grievous and incurable? Will you be to me like a deceptive brook? Like a spring that fails? Do you know that Jeremiah gets so upset that he curses the day he was born? After you had just heard God say, God is going to bless him and make him a fortified wall. Do you remember what happens to Jeremiah? They threaten to kill him. They threaten to stone him. They mock him. They ridicule him. They throw him in an empty water cistern where he begins to sink, nearing death. They hang him up in the middle of the courtyard. They, 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 they do everything they can to despise him, to hate him, to reject him. Do you know that Jeremiah's ministry is a failure? They did not listen. How do you make sense out of what God said to Jeremiah? I have sent to uproot, to tear down, to destroy, to give you a voice amongst the nations, and his ministry becomes a failure. Let me ask you a question. Does that cause you to struggle with some double-mindedness? Does that cause you to struggle with some contradiction and perplexities? Because that is indeed a way of God. Take Michael Criswell out of the picture. I never existed. You never saw my YouTube video. If you read the Bible with eyes wide open, sister, it is full of one contradiction, perplexity, twist that you weren't expecting. Go left, now go right. Mystery after another, after another, after another. Okay? When you look at this is something that I want you to see. When you look at this Bible, your Bible, and you see the horrific amount of chaos, I mean, let's face it, the Bible is a book of chaos and pain and degenerate people and suffering and wickedness and corruption and confusion. Is it not? You have men's wife being raped, killed, cut up into 12 pieces, each piece, one a piece sent to Israel. That is so disgraceful and God allowed it. You have horrific things in this Bible. Now, if you look beneath the surface and you, and you look beneath the law of Moses, you look beneath the the stories, the supernatural events, the miracles, the sin failures of a David and Bathsheba. You look beneath the parting of a Red Sea by Moses. You look beneath the raising of a dead from Elijah and Elisha. You look beneath the pronouncements of judgment against Israel and Judah from the prophets. You look beneath the amazing poetry of the Psalms. And you say, what is the purpose of all this? If we're looking beneath the surface, what is God's main purpose in all this? Now, I'm not going to go into it long now. This is going to be something that will be highly detailed with scripture and everything you'll see on the website. The purpose of your Bible, the purpose of God in your life is a wedding. All the commands, all the stories, all the failures, all the supernatural, all the commands, all the precepts, all the law of Moses, everything you see in that Bible, all is rooted in God's singular desire to find and keep a faithful wife. How do we know? When you go to the end of the book in Revelation 19, the Bible ends with a wedding. Verse 7, Let us rejoice and be glad and give him glory. For the wedding 
of the Lamb has come, and his bride has made herself ready. Sister, when you and I come to grips with what is the main purpose of what God is doing in all of creation, in all of the Bible, and we find out there's a wedding, you are being called to a wedding. And the question has to be asked, are you bride worthy? I have to ask, am I bride worthy? That is what the whole thing is about. And now when you look at the scripture, you see that all the commands, all the stories, all the precepts, all the, you know, everything in the scripture is rooted in God's desire to find and keep a faithful bride. And everything is rooted in his troubles with two unfaithful spouses. When you look at the Bible this way, it opens up a purpose and gives light to the eyes that you maybe haven't had before because I didn't have it until the Lord helped me to see this. When I began to realize prophetically, God was working through Carrie and Persis to create real life earthly representations of the things that are in his heart, both things he feels pleasure towards and loves and desires and things he feels pain, anguish, hate, and judgment towards. Sometimes reading the Bible can become habitual. We take it for granted. Sometimes we get disconnected from the heart of the Father in the scripture. And so God will use examples in our life that help connect us back to the living reality and the living heart of God behind the word. And when you look at a carry and you look at a Persis, what you'll end up seeing in these teachings that come out is it's so clear that God chose them to create examples, to create a reaction in me of the desire, passionate love brings, the desire for a faithful wife, which I now have in Lisa, praise the Lord. And the pains of un unfaithfulness, adultery, the pains of hypocrisy, the pains of an unwillingness to confess sin and be honest, the pains of a lack of humility before the spouse who warns a spouse not to do that, and the pain of apostasy, the pain of loving God with your lips, but not with your hearts, etc. All these lessons come to life in my recordings and in my story. They all relate back to how we treat God. Carrie and Persis are both pictures of how we all treat God. They are meant to be warnings exactly as a Gomer was through Hosea. They are signs God chose to use the spouse of Ezekiel to make a sign by killing her dead, even though she didn't deserve it. Doesn't that cause a little double-mindedness? Doesn't that cause a little bit of perplexity? Why would you kill an innocent woman to punish and make a, a point to worthless people who are living in terrible sin? I mean, do you really see how perplexing things are when you really study the Bible? It should make you never even really be able to come and question me. Why not question God? And if God is the same yesterday, today, and forever, then he operates in the same level and realm of mysteriousness and perplexity today than he does then for those who are truly walking with him. I don't have a dignified bow tie Christianity that so many do, where you're not walking truly in the mystery of faith. Walking with God in faith is mysterious. I'm not gonna go into all this. I did a lot of this in the, the messages that were still up on YouTube um, and they're still up there today towards the end before I pulled things down that explains walking by faith is truly mysterious. Hence the reason it's called walking by faith. It's very perplexing. It's very difficult to walk by faith. Hence the reason so few people do, they want something that's very predictable something they feel in control of. This is the heart of man, the corrupt heart of flesh, okay? So sticking on point, when you look beneath the surface of my life, you can begin to see that all of the persecution from a Matthew 24, 11, who's the root of what became the mouth, it's just like Satan, it's just like marketing, right? So you see some ad for some product. And of course, the person who's selling it to you is very attractive because in their kind and their sweet, right? Like the pitch person. Taylor is like a pitch person for Satan. And I'm very comfortable saying that. 
very comfortable saying it's true. You ask, you, you, we're going to get to that question earlier about why do I cast judgment and criticize? The same reason Jesus did. Tell Herod that fox. He called people dogs. He called people pigs. There is a right time to do that, sister. He said, you're children of the devil. Well, if the same Jesus Christ is operating in me, did suddenly Jesus shut his mouth and he never ever calls people a child of the devil? Well, he calls Elimas a child of the devil through Paul. He says that uh, through Stephen, basically, that the Israel were the children of the devil, stiff-necked rebels. He criticizes them. So if the same spirit of Jesus Christ criticizing men like Herod and calling people dogs and pigs and, and, and vipers, then is not that same Jesus Christ still at work in me to be able to, when it's appropriate, to cast judgment on people? I'm getting ahead of your points, but just making a point here. So if you can see that Satan uses someone like Matthew 24, 11, who is godless and yet who puts on the form of godliness, right? You even admitted yourself, you now realize he's not born again. Well, what does that mean? That means he's being animated by the spirit who is now at work in those who are disobedient. That is the spirit of Satan who leads the whole world astray. So Satan doesn't use Matthew 24, 11, as a pitch man, because you can see how quickly people would see through his, fa his facade. They would see very quickly, like when I showed who he is naturally in those clips, you can say, my goodness, this guy is an absolute fool. And so Satan is smarter than that. So what does he do? He uses the fool cloaked in anonymity to use some sweet looking as Lisa says it was her voice, some very soft voice and a cute little petite 21-year-old girl who looks so innocent. She becomes the puppet. She is the, the pitch man. She is the, the attractive woman or man that you see in the ad of something you want to buy, but really it's some um, smoking, beer-bellied, smelly man, if you will, behind you know, the factory that makes that product. Um, that is now appearing to represent themselves as this beautiful person, right? So it's an image, and you can see so clearly how Satan used to animate her as the puppet, but the man behind the puppet is Satan through Matthew twenty four eleven into Taylor. You see this, how clearly it is. So again, looking beneath the surface, you can begin to see who's really at work and that it's all a charade on the outside. It's a mask. Jesus said, you call yourselves the children of Abraham, but if Abraham were really your father, you would do what Abraham does, but you are trying to kill me. So he's saying, I see that although you act religious on the outside, on the inside, Matthew 23, you are corrupt. You're full of blackness. You're full of dead men's bones. You're poisonous vipers. You're whitewashed tombs. You wash the outside of the dish. The inside is filthy, etc. Right? So you can see they hid behind this religious cloak on the outside. Their phylacteries wide, and they followed all of the 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 wearing of clothing guidelines and the operating in public, praying in public, doing everything on the outside. Jesus says was to be seen by men, just like our commercials are today, right? So if you look beneath the surface of all this noise from a tailor and from a, all the people that have come against me, and you look against, uh, look even against your questions about me, right? The root of all of these issues lie in questions about the sin of Carrie and the sin of Persis, not the sin of Michael. If you notice, if you can see this, Every problem I've had in this ministry is rooted in the sin of a Carrie or the sin of a Persis. If Carrie would have been honest about her sin, she would have repented and gotten right with God. She would have stayed married to Michael Criswell. Her children would be much happier and better off today, perhaps God-fearing children. There would have never been a Persis that anybody could have ever stumbled over. There would have never been any of these things that people could twist and cast evil suspicions on. There would have never been a taking down of the ministry, etc. Now, back that up. Everybody was fine with Persis. People saw the redemption in it. If Persis would have stayed faithful, if Persis would have humbled herself and did what God says to remember 
that it was God who brought you in this land and not forget lest your hearts become prideful what he had done for you, not thinking it was your righteousness that brought you in. If she would have done what the Bible said, respect your husbands, submitting to one another, remembering that her husbands are head, remembering all that God did to put us together, remembering the power of God that was evident in my life and stayed humble and taken my warnings, she would have never been led astray by Satan. There would have never been all this room for evil suspicions and doubts and stuff. So you have to understand, every question you ask me about comments on or off, YouTube on or off, defending on or off, what am I defending against? I'm having to defend this entire ministry against the sin of two women. I want you to really get this. It's so important to see this. Do you realize that when you read the Bible and you find things that don't add up and that make terrible sense, that make no sense to you at all, that they, they, they bring you such confusion and maybe make you doubt God's goodness? Again, just one quick example. The very beginning, it's not good for man to be alone. I will make a suitable helper for him, a suitable helper that leads him to his death. And then she has children, one of which kills the other child, and God protects the murderer. If these things don't cause great perplexity in your mind, then I don't think you're reading the Bible honestly, right? Or you haven't read it. Now, if you look at all of the terribly confusing things that God does and allows in the Bible and the things that happen, you could quickly go to God and say, God, I'm struggling, struggling with some double-mindedness here. Why is it that you say you cannot remarry and take a wife back after she's, you know, you've divorced her, but yet you allow David to take back Michal after she's already remarried another man? Why do you allow that? Why in the law of Moses that it says a priest cannot marry a divorced woman and you cannot have anything to do with a prostitute, do you then tell Hosea to marry a prostitute, a whore? Why? Oh, big questions. Now, these are just quick samples, and there are many of these. If you realize that all of those confusing questions and, quote, double-mindedness things that you have for God are not rooted in God. They are rooted in the sins of his two wives, Israel and Judah. Every difficult thing, every hard to swallow thing in any of the prophets, in any of the writings, is all rooted in the sin of Israel and Judah. Everything that you read about in the old covenant, if you can think of it, almost every bit of it that you find hard to swallow is rooted in two unfaithful women and their sins and their rebellion and their hypocrisy and their apostasy that when God then responds to, causes us to question God. If man was without sin, we would have a completely different view of God. We would have a completely different Bible. We would have no perplexity, no confusing uh, statements, no ability to cast evil suspicions on God, no bizarre dealings of God with men. Think about that. This is profound. If men feared God and walked in righteousness with him, the Bible would be written very differently and all the perplexity and their consternations and confusions would be removed. Listen, if my two spouses would have done what the Bible lays out is the bare minimum foundation of what you must do. To love the Lord your God with all of your heart, mind, soul, and strength. Love others as yourself. Love does no harm to its neighbors. Walk humbly before the Lord. Obey his commands and stay in meekness and in po poverty of spirit before him. Obeying his commands. If they would have just done that, there would be no reason for you to be able to send me an email saying you're struggling with double-mindedness. You're struggling to doubt my ministry. You're struggling with this, that, and the other. Do you, do you see what I'm saying? Every problem Michael Criswell has is rooted in the sins of Cary and Persis. And then how God dealt with me and them in the process 
left room for people to stumble, to apply pathetic human reasoning to, which is even mine's pathetic, and to cause confusion, doubt, perplexities, and evil suspicions. Not because of my sin, but because of their sin. I didn't commit adultery, they did. I didn't walk in a pride that wouldn't humble itself and accept correction, they did. I didn't lie and make up things that didn't happen, they did. I didn't fall into Eastern mysticism, they did. I didn't become a hypocrite, they did. And it, God can say the exact same thing as what I'm saying. I'm simply repeating what God would say. Remember when Jesus said, which of you can prove me guilty of sin? Do you know that I can say that, Allie? Not as a boast, I'm just saying it as Jesus Christ in me. I could say, which of you can prove me guilty of sin? Notice, they can't. If you could prove me guilty of sin, you'd be writing to me about my sin right now. You wouldn't be asking me about putting comments up or not putting comments up, leaving YouTube or not leaving YouTube, defending myself or not defending myself, which I'm still going to get to, by the way. But I'm trying to help us look beneath the surface. You would be, uh, Michael, I'm sorry, you're a sinner and I'm out. You can't convict me of sin because I'm not walking in any no sin. I have the capacity to sin, but as soon as I sin, within usually minutes, sometimes in the very moment that I sin, say something unkind, or if I've embellished something, the Holy Spirit immediately corrects me and I repent. So I have a part of me that's Michael, and, and that's now I wanna, I wanna move into to answer your questions. I think you and I are guilty of something that's the same because we're human. I think, and, and I'm, I'm, I'm speaking for both of us now, you can correct me if I'm wrong, but I think this happens to a lot of us as, as humans when we read the Bible. And I'm just going to now speak from my perspective, and you can tell me if, if you can identify with this or not. I have a tendency to read of the prophets in the Bible. When I read Abraham, when I read of Joseph, when I read of, you know, Ezekiel, I have a tendency to believe that these men were better than I am, that they were some kind of a supernatural made Christian. It's, it's, I naturally have concluded that. So that if I don't fight against that instinctive reasoning with faith, knowing what I read in the rest of the Bible and knowing what is really true, instinctively, naturally, without any effort, I just began to conclude that these were a superior creation to me. But when I read the scriptures with my eyes wide open, I see that's not the case at all. I see that with the exception of like Daniel and Joseph, there's not a single man mentioned in the Bible that doesn't have some wickedness pointed out about him. They all have stumbling. They all have some of them terrible, terrible errors. Abraham being deceived and listening to Sarah. Terrible deception. Horrific consequences that we can't even begin to calculate that resulted in Islam, right? You see Elijah tucking tail and running and saying, that's it, I'm done. You see Jeremiah crying out against God, cursing the day he was born, saying, you have fought against me and prevailed. You have deceived me. Wow. It starts to sound there like an awful lot more like me. They're, they're a natural man. Remember what even the scripture says that Elijah was a man of like passions. He was a man like us. I think the scripture has to point that out because I think naturally we forget. And I think my point is that people forget that even though God is doing some incredible supernatural things, in the lives of these prophets, that they have Adam in them. They have a fleshly, sinful nature in them. They have human weakness in them. And I think, before I answer your questions, I think one of the things that people forget is that Michael Criswell, even though I clearly have a prophetic call in my life, I mean, the greatest evidence will be when you see the new portion of the website about God's miraculous timing and you finally get to see it in a way that's understandable. 
And so you can see that there's nobody but God that can control time. Satan cannot control time. There's no precedent in scripture for this at all. He can bring fire down from the sky, but he can't control time. And so God decided to do something in my life that can't be counterfeited by Satan. Praise his holy name. And there's some good reasons that he's shown me he's done this, which will be explained on the website. But when you look at this and you see God telling me all these things in advance, like you can see that God tells me in advance, tell Lisa she's going to be your wife. And she is, and she's the most amazing wife that I, ca I can't even describe her. I can't even describe our marriage relationship. It's, it's the most beautiful, amazing thing I've ever seen on this entire earth. We literally don't even tell people about it because we think, well, they, they just won't get it. They won't understand it. Ali, when we're out, people stare at us in a way that I've never been stared at before. And it's not just because Lisa is beautiful. They stare at us. We can see people staring at us. The first time we were at a dinner together uh, where we sat next to these, this other couple, Lisa noticed that the, the woman, it's an elderly couple, she stared at us the whole time, not even looking at her husband. She just kept staring at us. We will have people in grocery stores that will say something about our relationship. We've had people at um, uh, like a, an, a park that we were at, uh, we ran into and they took pictures of us and they, they stopped and wanted to tell us how they had spoken about us earlier, saying what a loving couple that we were. They spoke to each other about us. And then an hour later, we run into them. And we see these, this thing happen over and over again. People notice something about us. There is a love that's between us that is absolutely tangible in the public. It is extraordinary to see it. When you see the supernatural grace of God to tell me about the tiny house, take a year off, build it. When you see 10 years, don't ask anybody for money. I never have, and God has provided everything I've ever needed. When you see, go to India and marry Persis, but there's 36 obstacles in the way, and God removes every one of them. And you see me sitting down with Persis telling her, I've gotten, we're, we're going to get good news about the visa. We're going to be delivered. And then the news comes in. This is prophetic. This is God telling me in advance the future repeatedly things that are going to happen. You've seen the videos. You've seen it happen. It cannot happen apart from me. But, 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 get this, all of that prophetic, all of this, you know, events being done in my life now with 777 days in between, I think we're up to nine or 10. I think we've just found another one. These things do not mean that I am perfect. They do not mean that I'm a higher level of Christian. They don't mean that I'm without weakness. They don't mean that I'm without the human emotions. They don't mean that I'm without sin. They don't mean that I'm without being able to get frustrated at people and flip over change tables and to say something rash. If she doesn't come back, I'm a false prophet and you should never listen to me. I am no more better when I did that than Elijah is when he sits down under the juniper tree and says, I'm done kill me. Or when Jeremiah says, I curse the day I was born. Do you see? It's amazing how we look over those events in their lives. We look over the father of faith making one of the biggest colossal mistakes in human history, having sex with Hagar. When the towers of 9-11 came down, you realize that's because Hagar and Abraham had sex with each other? Do you realize that? Do you realize the, the, all the terrorist threats of ISIS and all that that was going around that had the whole world afraid was because Abraham slept with Hagar? He listened to his wife? Why do we not see what a colossal mistake? Do you then question the double-mindedness of Abraham? Do you then call him a false prophet? Do you see how it's amazing when you really look at it? We're missing something in judgment of Michael Criswell. Now, I want to connect this to specifically what I believe is a good example with the YouTube comments. You're talking about how it causes confusion on my part. It creates double-mindedness of when comments or no comments being allowed on your YouTube channel. That is a perfect example of Michael Criswell making a decision, not God. You shouldn't trip and have any double-mindedness over the rest of everything that God is doing because you see some of the jar of clay I mean, I don't know how many times I have said this, specifically speaking of myself, about tripping over the jar of clay. 
God works through imperfect people. Just because God is doing all this supernatural stuff in it does not prevent me from being Michael Criswell. I am not an angel. I don't have wings. I'm not Jesus Christ. I have a part of me that conjectures all the time incorrectly. I just don't turn them into prophecy. I shared in my journal recordings about the dates 211, 212, and 911, and I put that out there as part of public information. I was wrong about the event. I was right about the outcome. The human part of me was the part of me that conjectured excitedly, hopefully, about God putting my wife and I together. Do you see? I am not some sort of person that's absent of a human nature. So I'm able to make mistakes, and I think it's important that I put that out there. It shows that God can still use you, even, and you don't have to be perfect. I mean, I've been saying this in the very beginning of my ministry, that you don't have to wait until you become perfect for God to use you. So when you see the comments that I went through on and off, on and off, that was a perfect example of Michael Criswell leaning on his own understanding. And that's an example of me doing something without seeking the Father. And at first, they were so becoming so filthy after the Persis thing, right? That gave people a lot of room to begin to kick stones up and pick stones up and throw them at me. So I decided, okay, I'm going to be done with all this and just shut them down. You would too. You, you would just, just be like, if you saw how much filth was coming in. I mean, there were people commenting. This one woman said, has anybody seen Persis? No, the reason why is because Michael killed her and buried her under the tiny house. Now, let me ask you a question. And, and there's many, many, many bad ones. That's just the worst. Why in the world should I be um, thought a fool for taking comments down when stuff like that started coming out? I mean, wouldn't you have done the same thing? So I took the comments down. But then I started thinking, man, I'm missing the blessing that comes from being cursed. And I had gotten to a point where I can take it. I'll still have a passionate plea against people to see you're a fool, you're a liar, you're deceived. I'll still passionately say it just like a Stephen will. You blind, stiff-necked fools always resisting the Holy Spirit. But I started to feel like, man, I'm missing that blessing. So I then took a decision of myself, my own human reasoning, thinking of myself, put the comments back up there, okay? But then I got an email from a sister named Eddie Small in, in England, who is just such a dear sister. She's a tender-hearted sister. She would get so hurt when she would read these comments that people were saying about me, it affected her in a way that I wasn't understanding. To me, it just frustrates me because I see spiritual blindness. And the part of me that's Michael almost never can give up on the idea that if I just show a little more truth, if I just show a little more scripture verses, if I just tell a few more of my journal stories, then the person can finally get it. I've, I've been... This is one of my biggest, this is my biggest weakness, Ali, in this ministry is, and it's what has brought out a lot of this frustration that you can see in some of my messages where from thousands of people standing against you and you desperately wanting them to see the truth and you so frustrated that Satan has blinded them and you so frustrated that they can't see, it is my greatest weakness. You just have to accept it. This is my greatest weakness. Michael was stubborn and always believed if he could just give a little more evidence, they finally could see it. You know, we all have to have weakness. That is my weakness. I have not been able to rest on the sovereignty of God's election. I have not been able to just say like Jesus, leave them, they are blind. Ali, I'm admitting to you, I have not been able to to give up on people like that. I've not been able to give up on the truth. I've not been able to give up defending the testimony and the words of Christ. I, I've not been able to hope, to stop hoping. That people could see the truth. I've become a warrior for the truth. And yes, it comes out violently sometimes, right? It comes out harshly sometimes. I'm aware of it. I don't like it. I wish I could have been more like Jesus in that way where he just said, leave them, they are blind.
But then I had the problem with, you know, I can't just gather all of my people to me like Jesus did. When he said, leave them, the people that stayed with the truth stayed with him and they left and they left those people where I couldn't do that on the internet. The people are constantly left behind with all of these Pharisees there to still constantly pick up and throw stones, cast evil suspicions, cause misunderstandings, and in the words of Satan coming out of their mouth. And so doing a ministry online today has, has got some real unique challenges that we go through unique sufferings and there's a uniqueness to having thousands and thousands and thousands and thousands of people for the better part of a decade misunderstand you but all you want them to do is to see that God is really with you and you end up having to answer stupid emails about why do you do comments and not do comments why do you leave YouTube for good and then put on and people can't see beneath the surface they they they, they trip over these and I'm not trying to make fun of you this is my this is my frustration from years of having to, to answer this question. And rather than people being busy about taking up their own cross, denying themselves, and doing what I'm doing, they trip over all these things. And, and I am the fool for having believed that if I just persisted a little longer, people could see the truth. And they can't. A tear can never become a wheat. An Ishmael can never become an Isaac. I first heard that from Charles Spurgeon about an Ishmael can never become an Isaac. I have tried with everything I can to defend the words of God and his ministry in my life against those who have been used of Satan to cast evil suspicions and to cause doubts. And unfortunately for some, God left enough Michael Criswell and enough of my mistakes and enough of my failures to cause people who didn't have eyes to see and ears to hear to trip. He filters people out. Then there's this group of people who are able to see past the mistakes, who are able to recognize God puts this power in jars of clay to show that this all-surpassing power comes not from us, but from God. They're able to see it. They're able to know. And they're able to say, okay, I see him sitting down under the juniper tree wanting to quit. But I know God is with that man. Okay, I see he's married a whore, but I know those are the words of God coming out of his mouth. Okay, I see that his wife just died in one blow, but I know those words and the things that he has suffered to get this message to us, I'm speaking of Ezekiel, that he's a man of God. Okay, I know he just cursed the day he was born and called out and said, God, will you be deceptive waters to me? You prevailed against me, you've injured me. But I know God is with Jeremiah. No one could speak the way he speaks if God were not with him. I know he does weird things, putting himself in the stocks and coming out and speaking to us like this but I know that God is with him. There are people that know this stubbornness. I see the same stubbornness to a degree. Jesus tried for a time. He would plead with people. You know, we testify to what we have seen and what we know, and still you people do not believe our testimony. You can see Jesus is frustrated. He would say, please believe me that I am the Son of God. Believe that I am in the Father and the Father is in me, if not, believe on the evidence of the miracles myself. And he says, you know, why do you not believe my father's works? These works testify. And you can see that he's trying to a certain degree to get people to believe him. But then eventually, when he sees they can't get it, he begins to speak in parables. And he says to the disciples, leave them, they are blind. And I've struggled with that. Now to, again, make the point, when you ask questions about comments, no comments, leaving YouTube, not leaving YouTube, defending, not defending, so many of those things can easily be said to be in the category of, that's Michael being animated by Michael, not by the Holy Spirit. But that does not mean that I'm not a godly man. It doesn't mean I don't have a very 
significant prophetic call in my life, that God hasn't used me, that the words of God are not in my mouth, that my messages are not from the Holy Spirit at all. You have to really wrestle with that and, and, and put the two people in categories. I mean, Michael Criswell is right there. Every time some new bad news comes in, Michael Criswell reacts in his flesh that then the regenerated part of me, the spiritual part of me, puts down by the power of the Spirit. But occasionally, that part of me that's me gets a blow in, doesn't it? And again, the comments is perfect. I wasn't thinking of other people. And then when my wife told me when she goes to the comment section and she feels sick when she reads some of these things, I began to go, wait a second. This is wrong of me to do this. This is causing my brothers and sisters to stumble. And then God led me to that passage of scripture about getting all the filthy out of my camp. You know, Jesus didn't stick around and allow the Pharisees to keep saying what he was saying. He, they moved on. And there was no comment section that followed Jesus and his disciples everywhere they went. It might have been new ones, but then they would walk away from them and they would go to a new place and a new place. But here, it'd be like if every time, you know, somebody said something evil of Jesus in town number one, that it got put on his shirt and he had to carry that accusation with him to the next town and then the next town and then the next town. That's how YouTube was working. These things just stay up there and they have a, a voice that never ends. And the Lord finally showed me, get rid of these. And it should be very obvious after the most recent video that I posted, not the testimony of Layla and Gary, but the deconstructing Satan schemes, that all these comments are rooted in Satan. So why would anybody now, you know, be concerned about me taking them down? I don't let any of those filthy comments. There's, there's nowhere that says I need to have this be a free-for-all. And they make it out like they're so upset that they leave comments. No, they won't. Do you think if I went over and posted a bunch of my stuff that I have on them that they would leave them up? No, they wouldn't. Let's just be honest. They wouldn't. Supposing I go over to their channel which I never did, by the way, and I'm going to address that in a minute. But supposing I went over there and put a link to the, to the video under every one of those 1,600 comments, you think they would let those stay? You think they would allow uh, uh, this, this, this message here to be put up under their comments? Okay, so I hope that addresses the issue of leaving YouTube for good. As far as I know, I have left YouTube for good. If you'll notice, I'm not doing teachings I'm still addressing the same issue we left off on, and I'm now only addressing it after not saying anything for all these months, with the exception of one video, which I'm going to get to in a minute. So as far as I know, I'm still off of YouTube. So I don't know that that's an issue you need to face with. But if the Lord tells me to come back on after he's now been so pleased and merciful to vindicate me, then why would we have a problem with that? Why, if the Lord said, shut it all down and wanted it to completely go away, and then why, if God resurrects it, would we have a problem with that? Doesn't he do this all throughout Scripture? Isn't that one of the principles that he would take away but then bring back? So if he wants to do that, so be it. Um, I really am indifferent to it. I'm holding it loosely right now, but when the Lord tells me to put up a video, I put up a video. And if he wants me to put it on YouTube, I put it on YouTube. But I would say to you that you can't consider this me being on YouTube. There's not a thing in that video that wasn't on the videos before I left YouTube. It's all about simply bringing the truth to light of what was in the attacks against me that caused me to be leaving YouTube to begin with, okay? Why do you cast judgment on those that criticize you? I don't remember the video, but then you mentioned calling those that oppose you devils or Taylor as a Jezebel. It reminds me of a critique that you made of Benny Hinn in the John 7, 17 challenge where Benny Hinn said that he wished he, God would give him a Holy Spirit machine gun. Okay, I have never said that God, I wished God would give me a Holy Spirit machine gun to kill these people. When you saw me reaching out to um, Taylor in that video where I did I Have Deceived You, where I spent the first 30 minutes trying to act out everything that people have accused me of for the 10 years to, to answer a fool according to his folly, which I had done seven months and seven days before Taylor put up her video. And then one day the Lord brought it to my mind and had me put it out, no doubt also to cause a lot of people to stumble that were hanging on the edge. The people that were truly with me, they saw right through it, they knew exactly. And then the people who hated me, they immediately ran to Taylor's video telling everybody, hey guys, He's just repented. He's just confessed everything. Not 
hearing the whole matter as the scripture says, thus bringing shame on themselves, showing how devilishly delighted they were to see what they thought was a confession when they had been had. I mean, it just shows how foolish their thinking was. So God used that to clearly separate. But in that video at the end, I said, Taylor, please humble yourself. And then I called out Matthew 24, 11, and I said, you're not even a Christian. Get off of YouTube. This is before I found out the fool that was behind Matthew 24, 11. This is before I even knew who he was. I didn't know he was JP and JC at this time. I didn't know that he was making videos, coloring his hair blue and almost sucking his dog's eyeball out of his head with a vacuum cleaner and making repeated foolish videos of himself going through Dollar General saying explicitives and just being basically obsessed with things on the shelves or not on the shelves at his local Dollar General store. Very, very bizarre behavior. Anyhow, before I ever knew any of that, I judged a tree by its fruit and said, this guy is of Satan. Now, let me ask you a question. Did Jesus Christ, who I'm to follow, ever do this? Yes, he called people, he called Herod a fox, he called the Pharisees snakes, he called people dogs and pigs. So Jesus had a time when it was appropriate that he would say, you brood of vipers, you wicked people, you. And then we could say, if Jesus was only the one to ever do that, then well, maybe I shouldn't do that. But he's not. Paul did it, Peter did it, Stephen did it, and you can see countless times. I mean, think about it. Paul looks at Elymas and says, you child of the devil and an enemy of everything that's good. Paul is not Jesus, but Jesus is inside of him. Filled with the Holy Spirit, it says, when you read that passage. Paul looked at Elymas and said, filled with the Holy Spirit. So we would ask, is it not possible and likely that I've been filled with the Holy Spirit to say you're acting like a Jezebel or that you are a child of Satan? You may not like to, to see that, but that is very much a part of the gospel. That's very much a part of what it means to, to sharply rebuke and correct. I don't go around calling very many people this, but yes, these people have been taken captive of Satan to do his will. I'm 100% confident of it long before I had all this proof that I, I came out. But I don't have a, my hope has always been that they would repent. But I, I'm going to speak out loud and say, you guys have been taken captive of Satan to do his will. You're doing the devil's work. Jesus looked at all the people who claim to be religious and he says, you are not children of God. You are children of your father, the devil, and you want to do his will. Am I guilty of doing anything that my Lord hasn't done? The Lord who lives inside of me. So that should completely answer that. There is nowhere in the scripture that says you cannot criticize, that you cannot call a tree by its fruit. When Paul says of Demas, because he loved the world and deserted me, when Paul says of Alexander the metal worker, you should avoid this guy, he strongly opposed our message. The Lord will repay him. When he looks at Elymas and says, you child of the devil, and Stephen looks at the Pharisees, I mean, you know, teachers of the law, and says, you stiff-necked rebels, always resisting the Holy Spirit. You know, you can't do anything good. So there is a precedent for that, and it's not something I've done often, but I'm telling you, you will find out when we get to heaven that this is true. A tree is recognized by its fruit, and these people's fruit gave them away. We have to have the ability to discern who is with us, who is against us, who's a child of the light, who's a child of the dark, who's a child of God, who's a child of Satan, okay? Three dates in prophecy. When I look at the Old Testament prophets, I do see that you are correct in the way they prophesied things that would come to be or even things that they themselves did not fully understand. However, God never gave them a specific date. Not necessarily true. He told the Shunammite woman and Abraham, this time next year, you will have a child. Right? So there's an example. But to argue your point, I don't think you can find in the Bible I don't think you can find in anybody's life, even on this earth today that I'm aware of, I've not had anybody say it, 
where their entire life, every event is being organized into precise periods of time. Do you realize that when Lisa got off of that airplane in the United States of America, it was 555 days since I received my divorce decree from Persis? Do you realize that when she left to fly back to New Zealand, that it was 777 days since the day I told her she was to be my wife? Do you think that's just a coincidence? Every major event in our life is completely structured by dates and times. That's unprecedented. The only thing I can see in scripture are precise, amazing periods of time where God will do something on one year to the day. Or for example, one of the most remarkable is where even after he put the timing into Satan's hand by Moses saying to Pharaoh, you get to determine when this plague will leave. But yet when God has the Israelites come out of Egypt, they do so exactly when he wanted, 430 years to the day that they came in. Or when you look at Ezekiel and he says to Ezekiel, son of man, record this date, record this very date. And then you start to see that throughout Ezekiel's story on the 15th day of the 10th month of the 12th year, and you see over and over again, Ezekiel recording all these dates, you start to see, ah, the timing and the dates of this is very important to God. Ezekiel is the most time dated of any of the prophets, of any of the, the messages of the Bible. And then you see God connecting Persis's marriage and I to the exact precise fulfillment in dates and times of the 40s and 7s and the 150s and the 370 and the 70 and the Genesis 7 and 8 flood of Noah. And then you find out that Noah is the most um, detailed account of any event in the Bible time-wise. There is no other event in the Bible that has as much detail about precisely timing of events. It is remarkable. And what did God do? He connected my story. Have you forgotten these things? You see? So why is it that you would struggle that God would give me specific dates? I don't understand that if that's God's prerogative, and, and why did God allow me to conjecture that, you know, it would be Persis coming back or that uh, uh, Lisa and I would be married on 9-11 and instead it was just my tiny house arriving in New Zealand, which by the way, you're asking the question now about the New Zealand journey and that that looks like that's a false prophecy because Lisa had to come to America. How is that a false prophecy they're saying it's a prophecy that was 100% false because I already explained in the video, the prophecy was about the date 9-11. That's the only prophecy I've ever made. I know that I'll end up in New Zealand. I'm still not in New Zealand now, but there's something in the work now. We, it's just a matter of God's timing. Does God do anything fast in the Bible? No, but there's something now very significant that's at work that will likely lead to that. And we've just been patiently waiting. We brought here only after God, we brought Lisa here only after God um, told us to do so. And then we didn't realize it. We thought we were choosing the times arbitrarily, but it wasn't. It was a 555 day and 777 day event. It shows that it wasn't Michael and Lisa doing this. It was God doing this. But the, the New Zealand prophecy is not a fail. When you see me in New Zealand, you'll see that it didn't fail. The 9-11 thing was already explained. I assumed that when God was giving me a date the 9-11, because I was asking about him putting us together, that that meant, oh, he's given me a date. That'll be a date we are together. That's the jar of clay, sister. That's Michael. And, and please understand this. That's not something that I made a public declaration or a public prophecy about. This is my personal story. Prophecy is always technically about other people. If a prophet says something that will come to pass, it's not about what will come to pass in his own life. It's about what will come to pass in your life because you've been disobedient because the prophet has prophesied doom and gloom and wrath and destruction. If it doesn't come to pass, then you have a false prophet. Think about it. This is me personally conjecturing. Do you know that God said to Jeremiah one time, if you go and you say this to the people, perhaps this time they will listen. What does that mean? That means that Jeremiah didn't know if they would or if they wouldn't. And God said, perhaps he's not even telling Jeremiah if they will. And of course we know the story is they don't. 
But think about the difference between me personally conjecturing about the date in my personal journal. I never went online and said, hey guys, listen to this. I am prophesying the sky is going to fall on September 11th and it happened. And this is important for you to know because it deals with your life. No, Persis coming back has nothing to do with anybody else. It's not a prophecy about their relationship with God. Me prophesying about 9-11, 2-12, 2-11, those dates that came true where the date was right and the event was wrong, these things have nothing to do with your relationship with God, with your disobedience, with God wanting to bring a word to you. It was my life, my personal conjecturing in my journal entries. However, let's take note of this. What about when I'm in India and I'm pleading in tears in a voice recording that comes upon me that you need to get right with God and learn to walk with him now because time is running out. You've heard it. The the message is called, will your faith stand when the world falls apart? And I'm pleading with you that you've, chaos is abounding. And I'm specifically saying, you think you've seen storms. You think you've seen mass shootings. I'm telling you things are going to get much worse. And one year to the day, from the day I make that message, prophetically speaking to you publicly, meaning the audience that hears that, I'm I'm prophesying to the people, you need to get right with God, not conjecturing, oh, I think this means that Lisa and I are going to be together in my personal journal recordings. How do you then explain a year later to the day The biggest mass shooting in the history of the United States happens in Las Vegas one year to the day of the recording. Do you, would you be so willing? Do you have the faith to say that that's a coincidence? That when I specifically mention mass shootings and then I specifically mention storms, worst, you know, terrible natural disasters, that that next year, 2017, is the worst, most expensive storm season in recorded in the United States history? Could you possibly have enough faith to say that is a coincidence or that is a false prophecy? How then do you explain when I did it again in 2019, when nine months to the day, when I say, if you think you've seen darkness, there's a darkness coming on this world you haven't seen. And somebody says, my goodness, Michael, it sounds like you're prophesying COVID-19. How is it possible that after God does all these events in my life, nine months to the day, you've seen them, you've heard them in the story, that nine months later to the day, the first death in the United States of America from COVID-19, do you have enough faith to say that that's a false prophecy or that that's just a coincidence? How then when it happens again, do you say that's just a false prophecy, that's a coincidence? The third time when I'm pleading in tears, The one that I say I never wanted to admit this, where I have to admit that I have a prophetic call in my life and that that's why you're misunderstanding some of God's bizarre dealings. That was for the edification of the body, not for me. It was to help people see God is not dealing with me as Brother Michael. He's dealing with me the same way he deals with a Jeremiah or an Ezekiel. And all these bizarre things that are happening in their life is a picture of all the bizarre things happening in my life. Evidence now we can see fully of God using as a type and shadow, carry and Persis as a picture of two unfaithful spouses, incidentally of which God had two identical unfaithful spouses, Israel and Judah, both of whom he divorced, and then remarries while she's still alive. These things are not coincidence. These things are prophetic reality for him who has ears to hear and see, right? But in that video where I say, believe me that God has put a prophetic call in my life, and then Two numbers God has used so often in my ministry, 7 and 40, and in the Bible. Incidentally, the two very numbers he used over and over again in Genesis 7 and 8, 40 and 7. When I say time is running out, and I mean it. And then Russia captures Chernobyl exactly seven days and 40 minutes after that video is posted. Do you have enough faith to say that was just coincidence. Do you know that I then found another one, a fourth one, that I never even told that I'm aware of publicly? I may have mentioned it in some video that I don't recall, but I'll, it'll be on the new website. Five years before COVID-19, I am in a message. You can see the message on YouTube. It's, uh, I think it's called Finding Peace in the Storm. And in that message, 
I talk about how I now know America's days are numbered. Allie, do you realize that five years from the day that I said that, the CDC makes the first announcement that goes out on Twitter that COVID-19 is going to be a pandemic. The first announcement that goes out is five years to the day, five God's grace. When I say God's, America's days are numbered. Do you have enough faith to believe that all four of those are simply coincidence after you see a precedent in my life of God using precisely timed events such that when my wife lands here, it's gonna be on a 555 day event after the divorce, just like what you saw, the difference between the purchase of the trailer, the manufacturing, the tiny house trailer, and the day it goes on the land is 555 days. And there's other examples like this. Do you, these things are not coincidence, sister. This is God who says, I choose the appointed time showing my hand sovereignly is orchestrating all of this. But he's also the same God who left stumbling blocks in the life of Jesus Christ. He leaves stumbling blocks in the life of Paul. He leaves stumbling blocks in the, stumbling blocks in the life of a brother Yun. Even after all the miracles and all the supernatural, people were still believing he was a kook, still believing he's a fake Christian, still believing he's deceived, what have you. It always happens and it's my greatest frustration with God. It's the biggest thing that I wished when I got to heaven, I could say to him and admit to him, Lord, this is the part of you that I, I, I was the most frustrated about. I accepted it by faith, but Father, this is the part of you that I, I hated the most. I would honestly tell the Father that I disagreed with the way you did this the most, that you allowed there to be stumbling blocks in the lives of people who went wholeheartedly with you, that you allowed such confusing things to happen that you would have people prophesy via the Holy Spirit that Brother Yun was to go to uh, Shengzhou City because they needed leadership over there and they needed training. And then when you, you let him go, you only let him make it a day and a half through the conference before he gets the beat down and thrown in prison and all hell breaks loose on him. Why you allow that? Why did you tell him and, and convict him to go and have everybody believe this is going to happen, but when he gets there, this, something else is going to happen? Why do you allow these stumbling blocks like this? Why do you allow people to, why did you intentionally make Jesus Christ do all of his greatest miracles on the Sabbath intentionally to stumble these people, Lord? Why didn't you allow them to see? Why did you allow me to say that statement so that people stumbled? Why do you allow me to make the mistakes of turning comments on and off in my own flesh? Why do you allow there to be weakness in me? Why don't you just allow me to be like an angel, to be fully like Jesus? Why do you allow there to still be a jar of clay that people see it more than they see you in it? Why? Why is it that human nature demands that I be perfect in order for them to believe you are with me? Why did you do that, Lord? I tell you, that is the thing that is the most frustrating for me about God. If anybody wants to know the heart of Michael, what is the one thing you would argue with God about? That's it, Allie. It's the one thing that I've had the hardest time accepting. And I have felt so much pressure to defend God because of my weakness, because of my human. I hate my human. I wish I could be perfect so everybody would believe and that nobody would have anything that they could point at me and say, oh, he's, he's false. He took comments down. He put comments up. He's false. He put another video on YouTube. He's false. Lisa had to come to America to get married. He's false. The pain in my heart. It's, it's indescribable. when I correct people and rebuke them and they turn and say, I've become a false prophet. I am mean, I'm oppressive because they weren't willing to humble themselves. And when the birds of prey came in to devour their sacrifice that God was asking them to make, they allowed the birds of prey through somebody else that was godless to drive away the sacrifice that God was asking them to make, to set down that fear, to set down that pagan holiday, to set down that sin, to set down that lie, 
to do that thing that was making them uncomfortable in order that truth might prevail. And they failed. They allowed the birds of prey, Genesis 15, 11, to devour the sacrifice God was asking them to make so that they couldn't go all the way with God and God couldn't go all the way with them. These kind of things, and then when they turn against me, the pain that you pay to be a prophetic instrument is, is incalculable. It's, it, there's no way, and although I've tried to capture all these things in recordings, there's no way to calculate the weight of these things in my heart. Cult critique, number four. I understand to a certain extent the desire to create a positive online environment where believers can grow. However, the video introducing RHF did raise my eyebrows a bit. As it seems like you evaluate a person's faith and walk to determine whether or not they are worthy of membership. And you are absolutely correct. We do determine that. And you know something? If you would start today reading of the old ways, the old paths, you would see they wouldn't even allow you to be baptized in these so-called churches. They were churches back then. They wouldn't even allow you to be baptized until you had evidence that you were truly born again. Did you know that? This whole idea, this come one, come all, it never existed in the early church. You read 1 Corinthians 5. Should you not expel the immoral brother? Should you have not been ashamed? Have nothing to do with a person. Do not even eat with a person who calls themselves a Christian and does this and does this and does this and does this. You better believe that we evaluate a person's faith and walk to determine whether or not they are worthy of membership because Jesus Christ evaluates a person's faith and walk to determine whether or not they are worthy of membership in his church. The scripture says we must be found worthy so that we will not be unashamed at his coming, that we all must live at peace with one another and be holy, for without holiness, no one will see God. You better believe we evaluate a person's faith. You cannot knowingly live in sin. You cannot be a Heather Zibiati, come into RHF, and then start perpetuating the filthy lie of oneness theology that comes out of Pentecostal oneness theology, telling all of us that we're going to hell because we don't understand that the Trinity is a lie. You better believe I evaluate that person's faith and say that's rotten faith. They've been led astray from the faith. You better believe I'm going to warn a person like that and say, you have to drop this nonsense or you're going to have to be excommunicated from fellowship with us. You cannot bring this garbage into the membership you cannot bring this in there. You better believe we evaluate whether or not you're living in known sin. You better believe we evaluate whether or not we find out you're you know, doing something you shouldn't be doing and we're going to correct you. you. Yes, we do that to the best of our ability. And yes, we've had some people that have been so honest, praise, their, praise God for them, who when I sent them the invitation, they said, Michael, I can't enter in. I'm, I'm currently struggling and stuck with sin. And I say, get the sin out of your life and get in here. That's what the scripture teaches, Ali. How do you not see that in scripture? Do you not see all of the scriptures that say there are people who have a form of godliness denying its power have nothing to do with them? Do you not see the scriptures that tell us do not be dis I mean do not have do not be partners with the disobedient? Do you not see 2 Corinthians chapter 6 that says do not be unequally yoked with that of unbelievers come out from them touch no unclean thing and I will receive you have no fellowship with you know darkness what does light have in common with dark Christ have in common with Belial the temple of God have in common with idols. There is, a, there is a need to separate in fellowship. At work, I can be around pagans and heathens. In the coffee shop, I can have, you know, conversation with them. I cannot be, equal, I cannot be yoked intimately. We cannot knowingly have a person become a member who we don't believe is born again or who's not like actively seeking it with all of their heart to be born again. And we cannot have people who are knowingly living in sin or in deception without being corrected. The scripture says, Titus 3.10, warn a divisive person once. This was what uh, Heather Zibiati, you can tell if you listen to her videos, she's a very divisive person. She has a part of her that can be nice and funny and sweet, but she's also very divisive and she came in wanting to talk about flat earth, oneness theology and controversial things. She was divisive right off the bat 
My moderators recognized it, became concerned about it. What does it say in scripture? Warn a divisive person once. Well, how can you know who a divisive person is unless you judge them? I wanna ask you a couple of questions. If the scripture says, touch no unclean thing, how can you not touch it if you don't know what's unclean and what's not unclean? If the scripture says, do not be unequally yoked with unbelievers, how can you know if you haven't made a judgment over who's the believer and who's the not believer? If the scripture says, have nothing to do with the fruitless deeds of darkness, but rather expose them, how can you do that unless you make a judgment about what's dark and what's light? If the scripture says there are those who practice a form of godliness, but deny its power, have nothing to do with them, how can you not have anything to do with them unless you make a judgment about those who have a form without power? If the scripture says, do not be partners with the disobedient, how can you obey that scripture if you don't make a judgment over who's obedient and who's disobedient? Do you see how twisted the, the, the so-called Christian teaching today is that it's all supposed to be just all ooga booga, lovey lovey, kissy kissy, huggy huggy. It's all an absolute lie. Jesus said, he who is not with me is against me. Whoever loves me, will put my teachings into practice. He who does not love me will not put my teachings into practice. It is black and it is white. So if you're putting Jesus's teachings into practice, it's most likely because you're a born again believer, truly filled with the spirit of Christ, and you're going on with him. The Holy Spirit discriminates, sister. Jesus said, don't suppose I came to bring peace. This is a command. He says, don't fool yourself and think that I came to bring peace. I came to divide. Jesus is a divisive person, but he's dividing based on truth, not away from truth. He says, from now on, there'll be five people in one family, three divided against two, two divided against three. A man's enemies will be the members of his own household. Why is that? Why should there be, you know, this division? Because there are children of Satan. This is Jesus's words, John 8, 4. The religious people, not pagans, not just heathens, the religious people who believe they were children of God, Jesus says, no, you are children of Satan. I'm easily able to accept that by faith. I, I, I think it's strange. I think if I was standing there looking at the Pharisees, I wouldn't conclude that they are men who are children of Satan. I would have thought, man, these are incredible religious people. I know the Michael Chriswell in me would have revered a few of these people. I would have been like, whoa. But if I had faith and eyes to see, I would look at Jesus and I'd say, now hold on a second. He just said that those guys are the children of the devil. And I know that God is with Jesus. That sounds harsh. That sounds criticism. That's criticizing. Why is he calling them vipers and dogs and snakes and pigs? That's pretty harsh. That's pretty unloving. I realize that some people have tender hearts. And let me make sure you understand that I'm not in... I have no desire to run around calling people that and making these judgments, but the Holy Spirit in me divides. If you read of Sparks, Sparks taught this all the time, that the Holy Spirit discriminates between that which is true, that which is false, and that which will go on with him, and that which will not. That's why you see things happening with Brother Dan, Jim Gow, Sister Carol Ann, Heather Zibiotti. God will put me and them in a situation where God will touch that one thing in them. Like, remember the rich young ruler? This one thing you lack. The same Holy Spirit that spoke that through Christ to that man will speak it through me or through you if you're filled with the Spirit to other people. He will bring up, remember I showed John 16, convicting them of their guilt regarding sin, righteousness, and judgment. He'll bring it up and he'll discriminate and he'll test them and see, are they willing to let go of that one thing they lack? to start doing that one thing they lack. He tests them and if they can't go on, he turns them over to it and has me turn away from them. We do that in the, um, and by the way, something that nobody publicly knows, a cult leader, a true cult leader would never ever surrender leadership of his people over to somebody else. Do you know that I'm not even in RHF and I haven't been since it started? Lisa and I are, neither one of us are in RHF. It's the group of believers themselves, and some of them are really disappointed about that. I'll be honest with you, they are. Some of them really miss me being in there to keep going and giving them um, the teaching. Um, and we've had some growing pains learning how 
to deal with the fact that other people want to bring other content in there and we want to figure out like how do we vet all of that and we just can't. And we don't want to allow things like what happened with Heather Zibiotti and just have it be an open door where people can bring whatever teaching they want. And then Michael Criswell or Errol Stasinowski or Amy Lee or Rewa Aziz have to uh, spend time trying to vet and look through these teachings. It's, it, we're, we're learning in that thing and we're growing in that community to learn how to um, maintain truth as best as possible. And we have seen the devil get in with like uh, what happened with Heather Zibiotti. She was in for a time and then she showed her true hand, and when when the moderator saw it, we 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 play gatekeeper, and we get we get them out. She's free to go do whatever she wants on YouTube. She's free to go say and be just like she is. We don't stop her from doing that. But in RHF platform, I have a responsibility to protect the sheep, and man, I am going to protect them from people like her who will not heed the warning and bring in false doctrines of devils in order to lead the sheep astray. And to think of anything reverse of that is completely reckless and irresponsible. And to use the word cult, I'm just going to say to you, is absolutely foolish, it's ridiculous, and, and, and it is nothing but an attempt. I mean, listen, when you, do, when you say the word cult, you're parroting what Matthew 24, 11, a child of the, of the devil has said, who then used a separate person who's led astray by Satan to say when she made her video saying that I was going to start some compound in New Zealand and people were going to start living on it, that I, I was buying a bunch of property in New Zealand. Do you realize how reckless and irresponsible and foolish that is? And these people who called me a cult leader and did everything they can, that's all Satan trying to create doubt. How foolish Satan is when God then says, I'll put a stop to this argument. Michael, take the year off. I'm not even in the RHF platform. I'm not participating. I posted, um, they, everybody got to see the union between uh, Lisa and I, those who were found worthy to be a part of the marriage. They got to see all of God putting us together. They got to hear the story. They got to see the whole thing. They got to see the videos and all that stuff of Lisa and I, and then God called us out. So what kind of a cult leader would put together a bunch of people who hear a bunch of stuff online that Michael's a cult and they've just started, a, they've just joined a cult but then the cult leader suddenly disappears. I mean, honestly, I would just ask anybody, please use a tiny bit of human reasoning. A cult leader doesn't do that. And this RHF platform has a lot of time and responsibilities that I'm not even interested in. And I praise God that he raised up three people who were willing and felt called of God to help moderate people's comments because everybody's in different levels and we have to be careful. It's like you have to start thinking of it like a church and you can't just let any person off the street come walking in your church and put a book that they think is really great in your bookstore for all your people to want to read. You can't do that. And you don't just let anybody come up on the platform and start speaking. You have to vet them and make sure that they're in line with you theologically and doctrinally. So there's a huge responsibility that comes with all that. But anyhow, nonetheless, I hope this answers. I want you to know I've done all of this in hopes of helping you. And I'm going to share this because I think some of your concerns are legitimate. They're shared by other people. Lord willing, I'm going to place this recording up on YouTube for other people to hear. May the Lord continue to bless you. May you continue to go with him. May when he tests you, you be found on the right side of the test. May his grace be in you. May his spirit be upon you. May he continue to bless you and look upon you with favor, make his face turn towards you, and may he use you and keep you fruitful in the days ahead. May he help you to get and stand 100% in confidence upon him. Look past the man. Look through what Jesus Christ has done in through me in this ministry. And, and then be encouraged when you critique me and you question me and you have the double-mindedness that, wow, I see a jar of clay in Michael. And yet God still used him in such a powerful way. And that gives me hope because that means I don't have to be perfect for God to use me. So I hope that encourages you. God bless you in Jesus' mighty name. Thank you for the questions. Hope you enjoyed this message. God bless you in Jesus' name, sister. Bye-bye.